thank you very much, Lib. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like, first of all, to say how pleased I am to attend this forum and uh, to take part in this very timely and useful debate. Um, I will start by saying that, you know, yesterday, while I was promoting my presence to, to this event and I was encouraging people to register uh, on, on social media, I received several comments, uh, one uh, publicly, other in, in private messages, that were basically asking me, why are people discussing about recovery when the war is not even over? It's like putting the cart before the horse. And actually, when, when I read that, uh, I couldn't disagree more because um, as President von der Leyen said at the opening ceremony of the Ukraine Recovery Conference at the beginning of this month, uh, if you remember, she said, and I, I will quote this, while we work in these days to help Ukraine to win this war, we must also make sure that Ukraine wins the peace that will come afterwards. So basically, um, the recovery comes and goes hand in hand with the fact that uh, a country as Ukraine will need a constant presence of, uh, you know, defense and security that has to be enhanced in the region, but also needs to, for this to go hand in hand with uh, very needed and much needed investments and reforms in other uh, specific areas. And Ukraine proved already through the heroic resistance that ambition, perseverance and commitment to EU values are elements that will prevail. And this Ukrainian spirit can actually be felt throughout the recovery plan that was presented at the same conference that I was referring to previously. And this plan, um, I think that already provides some very insightful elements on how the economic landscape will change in the next decade and how exactly we, we will see uh, some of the of the elements shifting and the directions that we that uh, will be set at, at the EU level. First of all, um, th this is a plan that will require 750 billion euros, according to Ukraine officials. This is actually the same amount that the European Union raised to create the next generation EU. You know, the, the plan and the, the, the whole amount of money that were needed to recover after the pandemic. 90% of this money from the next generation EU has been used to fund the recovery and resilience facility. So the largest, and in my opinion, the most ingenious financial instrument created by the European Union. So the first question that comes into, into my mind is how exactly will the money be raised? Because the European Commission uh, announced already a set of measures and uh, uh, a reconstruction platform to coordinate the rebuilding of Ukraine after its war with Russia. We know that there have been um, money that have been raised in, in several occasions. Uh, the EU leaders pledged to assist Ukraine. And actually, since the Russian aggression started, the EU and its financial institutions committed to, to mobilize, I think, around like uh, five 0.4 billion euros to support, to support Ukraine's overall economic, social and financial resilience. These came in the form of uh, macro financial assistance, budget support, emergency assistance, uh, crisis response and so on. Um, and actually even more, three days ago, President von der Leyen also announced that uh, the EIB, so the uh, European Investment Bank, would also contribute with uh, more than 1 billion euros um, to support the rebuilding of the infrastructure and to resume the services that uh, Hlib was, was also mentioning in his introductory remarks. But, you know, if we make the calculations, this amount here is a long way until 750 billion euros. So this is why I think it is clear that private investments will be the key to reach the money needed. And in this sense, I believe that, for instance, the EU-Ukraine business matchmaking tool that was initially created to accelerate the work on solidarity lanes, if you remember when we had to facilitate in urgent, uh, in urgent um, uh, procedure the food exports from Ukraine via different land routes and EU ports, this tool, this platform of matchmaking between the EU businesses and, uh, and, and the ports and the Ukraine businesses, could be further developed and expanded in order to be a matchmaker for other common projects and actions. So therefore, my first lesson is that uh, the EU became more flexible in blending this type of public and private funding. And I think that this will prove to be essential if EU leaders are really commitment to, committed to rebuild Ukraine in a better and, and safer country for, uh, for the next generations. 
Now, second, um, the Ukrainian recovery plan is mirroring some unique principles of the recovery and resilience facility on which I, I had the privilege on, on working and, and on knowing it uh, actually by heart. So uh, we see, for instance, a clear understanding of the need to blend reforms and investments. And this is what the, the RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, made crystal clear. No recovery is possible without investments. No resilience is possible without reforms. And I think that Ukraine officials understood and applied this principle. And I'm extremely glad to see in this recovery plan uh, the, the, the initiatives of national programs that include both, uh, both types of, of elements. Then we see uh, also uh, the structure of this plan that um, is bringing together the pillars that are also at the core of the recovery and resilience facility. So the green transition, the digital transformation, economy and competitiveness, social cohesion, health, institutional resilience, policies for, for the next generation, for instance, education. All of them are reflected in the Ukrainian recovery plan. And what this leads me to say that this shows a clear commitment from Ukraine to rebuild and to develop in line with the EU priorities. So in order to be directly at pace with the other member states in the region. And this specific element leads me to my third and final point of this introductory remarks, which I think is also linked to the title of, uh, of our debate. Um, the projects that are put forward by the uh, Ukrainian officials have a clear pan-European dimension. So the more member states will engage individually to help Ukraine recover, the stronger the region and the EU will become. It is not only needed for the European Union as a whole to be involved into this recovery process, but also for the member states to play a, a great part in the bilateral dynamic that we have to develop with, with Ukraine in the, in the upcoming years. And in this sense, I hope, for instance, that the Romanian government will do more than just um, state its commitment, uh, you know, uh, in, in different documents and to actually develop concrete cooperation actions. And I, I thought I, I made a, a quick brainstorm and I, I could provide, for instance, some examples of how I, I, uh, I see uh, as, a, as a general uh, uh, feedback these, these uh, type of cooperation. For instance, the Romanian government could um, organize regular exchanges of ideas on common reforms that Romania and Ukraine must implement, because there are um, many issues uh, in the respective national institutions that are actually quite similar between the two countries. And this way, Romania could share the challenges it faced or faces when drafting and implementing legislative changes. Romania also has some good practices at regional and local level. And these can also be shared through exchanges with the Ukrainian regional and local authorities, for example. I also hope that some of the EU funds will uh, be channeled to local NGOs, for instance, as they could provide uh, grassroots social assistance. National companies and private investors, they will have a new market to expand. So the Romanian industry could really benefit from potential development abroad. And I, I find it quite... Uh, quite astonishing that we do not see this, uh, this potential yet. And last but not least, um, civil society could be further supported to organize forums of cooperation, such as the one that we are attending today, because uh, this format greatly encourages a very healthy dialogue that should be uh, really consolidated uh, between, between the two countries. So this is my, my, my first, um, some food for thought uh, that I would like to, to leave for our today's debate and uh, to also uh, listen to the other uh, speakers in the interventions. Thank you very much.